Dan, I think it is time. I think it is time. Time for... <laughs> time for a vacation. Oh, yes. I have one coming up, actually. Two coming up Do you? here in a couple weeks. So, yes, uh, I agree. Yeah, I. it is just so hot outside. You know, we're in the beginning of August. I don't ever remember it being this hot. And I don't know, I just feel like I need a vacation, but where do you go? <laughs> you know, you usually go to the <laughs> beach or somewhere. I feel like going to Antarctica or something. Yeah, Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is hot, Dan. It is not healthy. It is it is unhealthy hot. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's the problem with my upcoming vacations is uh, my wife wants to go hiking and backpacking, and that <laughs> does not sound like something I want to be doing in this heat. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any ideas where you would go? Uh, we're going up to the UP, Upper Peninsula, Peninsula of Michigan, to Picture uh -huh. Rock, I think it's called. Is that by the Mackinac Bridge? I'm not even sure. I don't uh. know. When you, so what I know of Michigan, there's the mitten, right? Yep. And at the very tip of it is a iconic bridge that connects the mitten to the upper peninsula. Yeah. And that's the Mackinac bridge. I think it holds a record. It's like one of the longest suspension type bridges in the world. Maybe that could be. I, yeah. Yeah. I drove across it. And it's kind of unnerving because it's kind of, it doesn't have a road surface. It's that grate, you know, and you can like look down and see you know, yeah. the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'd want to go. I, there's a bridge in uh, Duluth that connects Superior to Duluth that's kind of like that. And you keep uh -huh. going up. It's really tall and you get up there and you're, I mean, I'm not a fan of heights. So I, I'm like, whoa, just get across. Yeah. We didn't get our vacation in this summer. We took a bunch of mini uh, excursions here uh, in Ohio, but you know we didn't get out to the beach. It's just the way the summer went. My daughters are older. We're getting them ready to be shipped off to college. And when our younger one gets into school, I think me and my wife might take a, a week off oh. <laughs> and go somewhere, maybe a location to be determined. That that's not, that would be nice. That's that's always the way to do it. Send the kids away and yeah. get away. <laughs> that is one of the other new realities of being self-employed. When I used to work at a, and I'm doing my air quotes here, a real job. You know, you get your two weeks, three weeks vacation, and man, Friday, e you know, in the evening, you hit the door and you're gone. And you don't care about anything that goes on that week until you get back. And now that you're self-employed, I don't know if you technically get a vacation because no matter where I go, my phone still rings. Uh, you know, there's still things that need to get done if, if I'm not there. So I can still get away, but it's not like a clean break. Yeah. You're still on the clock. Sort of. Yeah, I think... I don't know. I kind of have, it's, it's more of like a, the, the lifestyle makes sense to me because I can schedule everything around my private life, you know, my hobbies, my enjoyments. Uh, but it is one of those, it's just one of those things where you just, you know, you just can't get away from it. But at the same time, it doesn't bother you. You're right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, if I had my office job and if my boss kept calling me while I was on vacation, I'd just, you know, that would just ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been a fan of those. Like, uh, you know, you take two weeks off once a year for your big vaca yearly vacation. I've always been more of a, you know, take a couple days here and there, do a couple small things, maybe take a week. But I know a lot of people that, like you said, are in the corporate setting that they take two weeks off and that's their time to just recharge and then mm -hmm. you know that's it one time yeah. a year done i never did that i was what you had said the first time you know we would just take short vacations long weekends kind of a thing. yeah uh-huh 
Yeah. Nothing better than a long weekend. Oh, yeah. Fun. My wife and I talked about that. I don't know if it's because we live out in the country, <laughs> you know, and there's <laughs> not much to escape from, you know, because we kind of like it where we live. We don't have neighbors and it's not like we want to go on vacation and go out to the country, you know, because we live here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that goes back to that the saying of so many people spend their weekends escaping from the life they have instead of building the life they want. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that would be you know, for instance, the way I'm doing it, being self-employed now, and yep. you know, that's just that's what I chose to do. And you know, if I have to take phone calls when I'm on vacation, then so be it. It's just the way it's going to be. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, especially in firewood too. And that's where I think, um, you know, firewood is a very labor intensive industry because you kind of like got to make firewood. <laughs> sort of, <laughs> yes. Yeah, one of the lonely feelings is when you want to sell something and you don't have anything to sell. <laughs> so that's, that's a big motivator. Yeah. And that is, you know, when you go on vacation, you know, you can't, you can't make firewood. No. I think you could still sell it if you have someone that could, you can call them up and say, hey, take a third of a cord of firewood to, you know, this customer. Yeah. I think you could probably <laughs> pull that off. I, I mean, uh -huh. but yeah, you can't get much made. <laughs> and that's what I think, you know, there are different ways to skin the cat as they say there's different ways to make money in firewood there's different ways to sell firewood there's different types of businesses and uh where i'm going with this dan let me pose a question to you are you ready oh yes okay this is a scenario let's say that you live in a townhouse your personal vehicle is a <laughs> is a an electric prius <laughs> i'm following your wife, so far <laughs> <laughs> your wife drives a an suv uh you have a one car garage all right and you're in the grocery store and you're talking with this nice old lady in the dairy aisle and she's saying how bad the winter's coming up and man, she could really use some firewood. And she turns to you as a stranger and she said, sir, if you could get me a cord of firewood, uh, I'll, I'll pay you for it. Hmm. Okay. Yep. So you live in a town hall, you drive an electric car. And now this old lady has asked you to get her a cord of firewood and she'll pay you for it. So I'm asking you, Dan, how would you solve that problem? How would I solve? That is a very interesting situation and scenario. Um, well, I would, if I really wanted to solve this problem and really wanted that, you know, to get the cord of wood to that old lady. And, and you can make money. money doing it. Yep. And collect the money for doing it. Yes. Um, I guess I would first look to see uh, if there was any wood available for sale at what price I could buy it from that supplier and then what price I could resell it to that woman for. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it could be done. So how are you going to do it though? You drive a Prius. Yeah. Uh, well, you could. I could rent a truck or perhaps the supplier I'm buying from would deliver it to this location for me. Okay. You, I think, are passing my test. Oh, wow. All right. You, <laughs> congratulations. You have just earned yourself a very uh, high-end title. You are nice. now you are now a middleman. Oh my goodness. I always try to avoid the middleman. And I've become <laughs> the middleman. <laughs> yeah. I I yeah. laugh at those comments. You know, people are always like, you know, bad mouthing the middleman. But you've just you just served a very important role, and you are a problem solver. You found a buyer, and you found a seller 
and you brought them together. Yes. You know, and that happens everywhere in this country and in our economy. It's, it's practically built on that. They, the buyer and the seller need to find each other and the middleman or the middle woman, the middle person, uh, serves such a vital role in bringing those two people together. And that's what I think in the firewood industry, there is a business model for just that. You know, you can be successful in selling firewood without owning a saw or a pickup truck or acreage. Yeah, I guess the more I think about it now, you are right. You are correct. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with it. No, it would you know? be, um, yeah, you just, like you said, you are just connecting the dots of a supplier and a consumer. And it's probably something that, yeah, never has really been looked into as far as the firewood industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you had a, a, an old lady who asked you for firewood. Can you get her some? And you don't have anything... <laughs> in your backyard or in your garage and you don't even have a saw. So I, and then I'm hearing your problem solving. You already said that you're going to go find it. So you're going to source, you know, yep. and it's not like you're procuring it where you're bringing it back to your place to, to inventory it. You're just taking it from someone else's property and having it delivered to another. Yes. What I also liked about your problem solving, Dan, is you thought, well, how can I get it to this lady? I can rent a truck, you know, or you can find someone who has a truck. Yep. So that person can get paid. The, the manufacturer, the producer of the firewood can get paid. The lady can get her firewood and you can create some profit out of that. Yeah. It may not be a huge profit margin, but it would definitely, it could definitely be a profit margin that you could scale up then. And yeah, continue you, expanding. It, you, you know, you are not, you are losing some of the profit because it's going to the shipper. It's going to the producer, but at the same time, you never broke a sweat. You never banged your shin. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't buy a saw or bar and chain oil or a processor or a log splitter. Now, of course, that is where all the fun lies. Yes. I was just going to say, I miss out on all the fun though. <laughs> yeah. With firewood, that's where all the fun is, but that is the way, and that is what I have developed into in, in firewood, you know, and that's where people think about, you know, oh, if I wanted to sell firewood, what I got to get this splitter. I wonder what saw I should get. I wonder what processor I get. I wonder what kind of truck I should have. When really I think you should be thinking of where's the customers at? You know? Yeah. And if you could make a sale, and that was one of my early lessons was I don't even need the firewood physically myself to sell it. Because there's firewood for sale everywhere. All over the place. All the time. Yeah. And it's I'm cheap. liking this. I'm I'm liking yeah. what you're what you're bringing up here. This is very interesting. Here is a challenge that I would I would lay out there for someone to take us up on this. Let's say that you live in New York City. You could get a website to sell firewood in Raleigh, North Carolina and take phone calls based off that website people saying can you deliver wood to you know main street raleigh north carolina you could get on the phone find someone in raleigh who has firewood and pay them to deliver it and have the customer pay you over the internet your profit yes you know i think it can be done i think it can so be why, done. yeah why work in your hometown People complain about the price of fuel. Well, here's your answer. There you, there you go. Although I could see a few hangups with that scenario. Mostly on the side of the supplier. Yeah. And the supplier being able to, number one, accept electronic payments. And, you know, then being able to, you may not be able to see the quality of the product 
Mm-hmm. So that could that, but I see the biggest challenge just the fact that it seems like everyone in the firewood industry is stuck with cash only. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like they're kind of fallen behind the times. My last restaurant I picked up was because their their previous supplier only wanted cash. Yep, <laughs> he yep. wasn't equipped for electronic <laughs> payment, so they said, "See ya." <laughs> yeah, and I and I think that's a, a valid point to make with, you know, as the firewood industry moves forward, I think those that are willing to change and possibly move into like a business model like this, I think others will just be left behind if they're just, you know, remaining yeah. in the old ways. <laughs> yeah. And when I first started getting this idea was when I started buying firewood, you know, so I buy tree length logs for my processor and I make it myself. But I also buy firewood, and that just happened by accident. I would drive down the road, and I just saw it for sale. You know? And I was thinking, this guy's selling this cord of firewood, you know, for one hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm buying my trees for a hundred dollars a cord. I was thinking, this guy's just put all this labor in here for fifty dollars. That's a good deal, you know. Yeah. So I would start buying firewood, and I don't know. I, and then when you develop that relationship and you pay that person well, and you're trustworthy, uh, I've developed relationships like that where they only now make firewood for me Yeah, and I've wound up paying them more than what they were going to ask for just because of the convenience too, because I leave it at their place. Yeah. Uh Wow. Yeah. So that's what got me started on this was, well, if I'm not going to make the firewood myself, but have someone else make it for me, you know, and I'm bringing it back to my place and stack it, can I do even better than that? (laughs) Yeah. You know, no, I haven't got to that point yet, but that is still on the back of my, in the back of my head. You know, yes, I make my own firewood and I pay people to make it for me, you know, so I'm trying to diversify like that because you know, if you can't get your logs, you can't make firewood. You got to get your firewood somewhere. So you're going to buy it. Yeah. God, uh-huh. I, and it's I, just the way business is. But then you get people that, I don't know, in firewood, they get offended by that. Yeah. Like they think, you know, I still have in the back of my head, one of my most bizarre comments I had ever received on, <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> just... <laughs> Oh gosh. I had to wind up deleting it though. Cause the, I have got two rules, you know, no politics, no cussing. And then, then, then the cussing started, oh. but I had mentioned about how I buy firewood and this guy says, well, does pizza hut, you know, go out and buy their pizzas off of Domino's when they run out of pizza dough, you know, <laughs> I was like, gosh, number one, that is the worst analogy I'd ever heard in my life. you know and number two that's it's it's, you know it's just a moot point yeah yep well there's nothing wrong with buying firewood and reselling it no heck no no and there's people out there though that think that you're cheating like you must kill yourself to make a quart of firewood (laughs) and and you and you can't make profit off of it you know you got to sell it cheap Oh yeah. That's what, if I had a magic wand, I would want to erase all of that attitude from the firewood industry. Oh boy. Yeah. That mm-hmm. you need a big wand. You might have to wave it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That has been my whole approach with Ohio wood burner is professionalizing the firewood, you know, my firewood industry. And I've always said, you know, do what you want, but this is how I'm doing it. And part of my plan is to buy my firewood. Yeah. You know, you know I just thought of something now that yeah. we're sitting here. Um, I talked to a gentleman at the Midwest Firewood Frenzy and he, uh, I forget what city he was in, but he was having uh, tree service companies pay him to drop off their wood because if they, they had to pay to take it to like the landfill, so uh-huh. he was charging like, you know, half of what they would normally pay to go to the landfill. So there's a situation where you could get paid to have 
some logs dropped off at somebody else's property, then have that person process the wood for you. You then buy the wood and sell it. And you're like, the whole circle is revolving around you and you haven't, like you said, broke a sweat. I like the way you think. And every, <laughs> and every step you could potentially be making money. Yeah. Wow. Uh-huh. I like the way you think. And you build a system, you know, and that's what a corporation or a business is. It's a system with, with moving parts that all revolve around the central mission, which is, you know, getting firewood into the customer's garage. Yes. Uh-huh. Yep. And how you do it is your business. Right. Or yeah. like, in yeah, in that situation I just mentioned, you could also say you then just uh, took the logs and bucked them into 16-inch rounds. You could yep. sell the rounds to somebody to process and then buy the process wood back from them <laughs> or, you know, right. make an exchange. And you could, because maybe say you, you're just like running chainsaws, but you don't have a splitter or a processor. So you yep. could be involved, but not fully involved. Yeah, I think that what you are bringing up is a excellent way for all of us to better understand the firewood industry. You know, you don't have to own the means of production or you don't have to own the entire means of production. You know, when you think of like, I don't know, if, if you read books on like the early car industry in Detroit, you know, with the integration, they would own the steel mills that made the steel that would get put into the cars. And now car makers are, you know, shipping raw materials to other countries that have it stamped and then reshipped back into the United States to yeah. have it assembled. And yeah. And I don't think, you know, firewood has, <laughs> you know, we're dealing with, with wood here, so it doesn't have that much <laughs> of a, uh, <laughs> profit margin to it but that type of mentality i think is just very interesting it makes me get excited about firewood yeah yeah uh, there's it, i'm 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 hoping right now someone listening is looking up on facebook marketplace to see what the cheapest face cord of firewood is yeah. and thinking about buying it and reselling it yeah split it in half and double your money right <laughs> Yeah. Or buy a whole bunch of it now, wait till the middle of winter, and then sell uh -huh. because everyone yeah. else will be out. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah, that's what when we said earlier that you know, there's always firewood for sale. There is a shortage around February, uh, but it doesn't. It's not there for long. You no. know, and then all of a sudden, all the the firewood stocks are back up. Yeah, but it's just a matter of finding a customer. Right. And yeah, that's why. I need to do a video on this, Dan. You know, the most important tool for a firewood operation, uh, it's the website. Yeah. You know, it's the website because without sales, you don't have anything. And I still think you don't even have to have firewood to sell firewood. You can still find it and find someone to ship it for you. Yep. Deliver mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That's what Put I meant it. by ship. Bucket, <laughs> split it, deliver it. Boom. Yeah. I get comments from people that they either, either they've had a injury or they have bad health and they just can't get out and do that kind of stuff anymore, but they're still ambitious. You know, this is a way to be in the industry and uh, be a part of the firewood market, but you're just doing it differently. Right. And there's not, and there's nothing wrong with it. No. Yeah. And you wouldn't have to pick sawdust out of your socks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I keep saying, Dan, that you and me give us enough time stacking wood. We can save the world. With I, firewood. I agree. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. This is a really interesting. Uh, hopefully this is sparking some thoughts in some listeners out there because because, yeah, I, I've actually got a few thoughts in my mind that are starting to roll around. Oh. Mm -hmm. And we can do this while on vacation. Yep. <laughs> while you're out getting your, I don't know, do you get your oil changed in your electric car? Or <laughs> 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 you could be at the, at the electric car shop uh, sitting in the waiting room and you're selling uh, firewood to a customer in, in Kansas. <laughs> right. 
Well, yeah. or even, I mean, even think of just how far things have come in the last year or two as far as connecting um, and having services like, you know, food delivered to your house. Like now almost right. any restaurant you can have, you know, DoorDash. So think of like a Ugh. DoorDash for firewood. Right. You know. Yeah. And that was one thing I had, I did a video on this and I really do think that firewood is well positioned for this new economy. And it was before the pandemic. I think the pandemic accelerated yes. a lot of trends. And the one trend was home delivery. You know, we had a knock on the door the other day and it was this elderly guy. I don't know who the heck he was. And here he was just a, a guy working for Walmart. He was delivering something that we bought uh, my wife bought, you know, off their website. Yep. Yeah. Home delivery. There are, for instance, Amazon, there are, they are now hiring contracted companies to deliver their stuff with your vans. Yeah. Or even just your, your personal vehicle. Like you can work for Amazon delivering packages with like your own vehicle. Right. Home delivery. And that's where, I, people always say, well, you know, can I come pick it up? And I, I say, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have local pickup. You know, well, why don't you have local pickup? Cause I, you know, I don't tell them this, but it's because I'm not in this to sell my wood cheap. You know, yeah. I, I get a good markup for good home delivery. So <laughs> it's, I make more money when I deliver it. I don't want anyone <laughs> coming to my place to pick up firewood, you know? So, uh, home delivery, it is, yeah. I, I think, and that's where, you know, the firewood is well positioned in that, but there's also, there's opportunity out there too, for people that can think outside the box. Yep. Know? And it, it, but it does involve that integration of technology as far as like payments, online communication, yeah. um, you know, and like you said, you could, you could possibly end up having an app that you know tracks your order tracks your delivery people can log on to it to reorder i mean you could take this to a whole new level sure i mean it yeah, yeah. without a doubt i uh, i understand cash i know why everyone does it and i don't fault you but i also have learned myself what professionalizing brings you and it's not that you're you may or may not get the sale because that customer wants to pay for it on a credit card. But what that gets you is you can charge more and make more per cord if you sell it as credit, even for the exchange fee that you have to, you know, you lose like a 2% something, yeah. you know, with, yep. with a credit card purchase, big deal. Quit worrying about that. Just mark up your prices. And I, I get a lot of customers that come to me simply because I'm like the only firewood guy in the Mahoning Valley that takes credit cards. Yep. It's a convenience for them. Oh, totally is. Yeah. And yep. I can also just text them the link and it's paid for before I even get to their house. Yep. And, yes, and tell indeed. me there, there's not a firewood guy out there who's ever unloaded their truck where the customer hasn't paid them yet. And they're worried the entire time they're unloading their truck. Is this guy going to pay me when I get all this wood <laughs> on the ground? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh. it's true. I still feel it like that. I've never been stiff, knock wood, but here you go. Electronic payments, man. Yeah. Professionalize. And then, then, then that gives you leverage where you can start being the middleman. Yeah. And just, you can still sell firewood the traditional way but you can add that wrinkle to your business. It can be like a different division where, you know, that, that side of the business can be another profit, uh, profit area for you. Yeah. Another opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, with that, I think I, uh, now that my gears are turning, I need to get back on this plane, contact a web developer, get an app developer and start planning out my, my, uh, my, new takeover of Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to go get online plan for my vacation and find a hotel in Antarctica. Because <laughs> uh, there is no firewood going on today. It is too hot. 
Yeah, it's been miserable. Yeah. But if you're sitting around also taking a break from the heat, here you go. Food for thought. Think about ways of expanding without increasing your workload. Yes. Yeah. Work with your, what do they say? Lift with your head, not your back. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Well, Dan, do you think it's time we strike up the band and let's uh, let's get out of here? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Mo this has been a very motivational, inspiring episode. I think I love this kind of conversation. Yeah, this was exciting. Uh, I think we need to do something like this in future podcasts. Yes, and we need to hear from people out there if that you have similar ideas. So send us an email at thewoodhounds at gmail .com. There you go. All right, Dan. I want to thank everyone for listening. Thank you for making the Woodhounds the number one firewood podcast in the world. Boom. Yes. And I'm going to tell everyone to stay cool. Be, be productive. <laughs> be fun. <laughs> and, and have a great day. <laughs> and have a great day.